next speaker is a bioengineering professor at Stanford. And at his lab, he and his team use basic research and engineering approaches to design and engineer biotic games that, targeted, that are targeted on educational challenges. Now, in a modern world where technology allows us to manipulate things better, they're constantly exploring how we might use those advancements to play with microscopic cells. So I'm excited for him to come to the stage today and share with you more about his biohacking work. There'll also be a workshop on biohacking games at 4 p.m. today. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ingmar Riedelkruse. Okay, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, who brought me in. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, how can we play with microscopic uh, organisms. Um, so what you see here um, is a, is a touchscreen where someone is drawing uh, colorful uh, pictures on it, which are then projected into a microscope onto these uh, single-celled organisms that you see here. And if you watch this movie for a little bit, you realize that these organisms actually avoid the blue light and start accumulating in these other colors. And that's kind of one of the most simple things uh, we came up with so far that uh, really emphasizes what it means to interact with an organism that is microscopically small and that we usually can't see with our naked eye. And during my talk, I will show you a number of different uh, setups that we've built for different purposes. Primarily, it's uh, for education, but you will also see that in the longer run, they will find other applications, for example, for research. Okay, so just to ground yourself, what you see here um, are computers, right? And if you compare the two, to the two pictures, you should see a number of, of differences, right? There's, uh, maybe you just take a moment and um, think for yourself. So this is basically a 50-year difference. Computers have advanced a lot in terms of how good they are, how easy they are uh, to use. And you can also sum it up in saying, like, these were primarily about number crunching, and this is really about an, an interactive experience um, that even children uh, can have these days. And if you look at biotechnology, what's going on there, we can actually see many um, and similarities in that uh, we now have microfluidic devices that are integrated that even have like valves on it, similar like, like transistors, and you can move fluids around in, in small droplets and make diagnostics uh, and other things happening. And similar like the image in the background, these are kind of still hard to use devices. Um, they are not as powerful yet as we wish hoped to. But um, they get increasingly better and we can really wonder what will happen in 10 years, 50 years. Will we have basically the same interactivity and, and the ease of use as we now have with our electronic devices. And so this was kind of a thing that, that came to me when I started my uh, faculty position in, in the bioengineering department. Um, shouldn't we somehow bring these devices into the hands of people and, and make it similarly interactive? And the initial ideas ha I had was like, let's make games out of it. Uh, and so let's start from there. Um, we coined them biotic games, and there are two uh, things we are primarily interested. One is these types of games should allow us to interact with small-scale uh, organisms. It should really be microscopic. And uh, secondly, it should be somehow in the enabled by modern biotechnology. So I'm not talking about something which is purely emulated or simulated, and also not something which is macroscopic, right, horse polo, right, which you could call ancient uh, biotechnology, right? And so here you see an example of the first thing we've built. So this is a paramecium. It's a single-celled organism about the size of a human hair diameter. This is a microfluidic chip about a centimeter in size. And you see four electrodes here. And whenever you apply weak electric fields, you see these little speckles. These are the cells that basically move along with the field lines, right? And so with this little game controller that is shown here, you can have a real-time interaction with these cells by uh, pushing a button, applying electric field, the cells are moving around. And if you then overlay some virtual objects, you can turn this into a game right? by getting points if you manage to get these cells somehow swim uh, through this box and lighting up these uh, uh, little dots. Okay? And you can, <coughs> you can make different games out of it by just uh, changing the overlay. Right? Um, so basically using the same, same game engine, and uh, in this case, uh, a soccer game trying to bring this uh, ball in, into the goal. 
So um, here's again uh, kind of the setup. It's, it's rather simple, hacked together, um, a webcam, microscope, this uh, microfidic chip, and then brought uh, this whole thing on, on the screen. And what this showed us is actually kind of the concept, what it means to play with cells. Um, but it also raised a number of questions. One is kind of long-term stability and, and logistics. Um, these cells usually were good for like 10, 15 minutes, and then you had to refresh them, right? So it's not like plug-and-play computer as, as we have. You may ask, what's actually uh, the utility of all of this? What is this good for? And I will talk about this later, but maybe education, right? We can talk about uh, the hardware, how programmable is it? How hard is it actually to develop games on, on these, these types of platforms? Uh, is this accessible? So could all of you do this at home? Or how would we uh, bring this uh, around? Um, you may ask, why not just simulating? Wouldn't that be much easier? Um, just write a computer program and emulate this for you. Are there ethics involved when you, when you play with microscopic organisms? And a number of, uh, of other questions. And throughout my talk, I will basically answer a few of those and show you where we went since uh, our initial uh, publication on, on this work. So in this first uh, project I want to talk about, is uh, we used uh, a different type of organism called euglena for the reason that it's actually uh, phototactic, uh, so sensitive to light, which is a more easy to apply stimulus than what you saw in the last one, and where we uh, wanted to make games that could be played on a phone, and on a cell phone, and where you also could even build the system yourself. And this is kind of also motivated by the education value of interactive toys that you see in other uh, areas, specifically robotics, um, is uh, very good at enticing kids and students to learn about mechatronics, right? And similarly, more recently, um, there have been these uh, competitions of saying, hey, children, program video games and thereby learn programming. And we don't really have these kind of things in the life sciences, right? These kind of interactive uh, things. So these are these euglena cells, um, 50 micrometer in size. They're a little bit smaller than what you've seen uh, previously. Um, if you follow them for a while, you may actually realize how they um, uh, move around, how they roll around the long axis. You may also see some speckles here, which is either dirt or kind of smaller bacteria uh, on a much smaller scale. If you also watch it for a while, you actually see hydrodynamic effects at these, these kind of different uh, length scales. Um, what does this organism look like? Here is uh, the cell. It has this flagellum. It actually has the flagellum at the front, so it would swim this way. Um, it's the same structure, actually, as a sperm tail or many other organelles in, in the human body are. And the other important feature is this little red eye spot here, which is actually sensing the light. And it basically has one eye, and it's, um, it's a zero-dimensional detector. So only in the direction it looks, it can recognize whether it gets um, uh, darker or lighter. And so with this flagellum, it can orient, it can roll around its own axis, but also orient itself in 3D space. And what the organism is doing is swimming along a trajectory, rolling around its own axis, and then there's a feedback loop between the eye spot and the flagellum, and thereby the organism is capable of doing phototaxis, either positive. So if the light is very weak, it goes to the light. But if the light is very strong, then it actually moves away from the light. And usually we use the, the negative phototaxis. Um, so here's the setup that we've built, um, just to concentrate here. So we have a quasi 2D plane, like this uh, microfidic chip, where the cells are. And then we have four LEDs controlled by a joystick. And depending on from which direction you shine on the light, kind of the cells start moving away. Some simple optics and then the phone. So here's the kind of the whole setup uh, in real. You recognize the phone, the optics here. And, and hard to see under here are the four LEDs and then also the cells. Here's the, here's the joystick. Um, and so we um, made games similar like uh, the ones you saw before, uh, kind of shown here. Now, in this case, we actually already tracked the individual cell, right? And uh, you see in this inlet here uh, which, from which direction actually the light is, is shining and then kind of driving these, uh, these cells around. There are also some other things uh, that are augmented. For example, you see the current speed of the cell. You see a scale bar. You see the cell, which is currently tracking and enlarged. And these kind of things are meant to emphasize uh, to uh, the person who is playing um, the kind of biological content, hoping that by playing these games, you would also learn something about uh, biology. Um, here's another example, a more Pac-Man-type style game, right, where you kind of try to let the cell move around uh, along these boxes uh, and, and kind of collect all, all, all these objects. Um, here you see actually the swimming trajectory at the end of this, this particular game. And so while doing so, you actually learn something about how noisy and how unpredictable the biological material is. 
Building this particular setup is, is kind of summarized in this uh, scheme here. So this is 3D printed microscope. Here's the electronics, and that would be kind of the thing in conventional mechatronics classes you would learn anyway. But then there's some optics involved here, and there's some simple microfluidics where with some double-sided tape and some plastic, you can actually can create these chambers and, and integrate these life forms um, in, into the setup. And ultimately, you have this... Uh, uh, little uh, setup here with the four LEDs and the chamber in, in between to kind of uh, um, affect these, these organisms. Uh, if you want to program games, uh, you currently need to do this in Android, which is a little bit uh, a harder thing to do. So that's why we also um, uh, supplemented uh, additional these activities with the Scratch programming languages, where you um, kind of you build a little simulator uh, for these cells, and you can even uh, emulate these these types of uh, games here, which is also good for kind of uh, prototyping uh, these games. Um, what can you uh, do with this without uh, playing games? You can put this thing on a regular uh, microscope. You don't need to build a microscope yourself. So here you see um, this uh, interaction chamber and uh, um, uh, cell phone. And then, for example, you can uh, do interactive experiments where you pick a cell, turn light on for different times, and then actually make measurements afterwards. How fast do the cells move? How uh, fast do they respond to light? Things like those. And right now we are kind of in the middle of, of, of um, uh, user testing, both with uh, teachers and, and with children, which is kind of summarized here. This is kind of a number of things the teachers uh, found interesting about it. Um, interestingly, teachers are not that enticed about games. Uh, children are. But what uh, the teachers only find interesting is if you can build the system yourself and Furthermore, if you have a screen where you even can select uh, individual cells and, and students can uh, discuss what they see, is actually a big advantage over just looking through a regular microscope. And here's a number of things that uh, actually kids draw after they play it uh, with these cells. Right? For example, see here like one, one child uh, kind of drew a little X on these cells, kind of emphasizing that this child understood that it's real, but not realizing how, how it really works. I also teach a class at uh, Stanford with students where the students are supposed to learn uh, how to build uh, devices in bioengineering. And essentially, they build um, a little bit more complex microscope than, than what you just saw. But while doing so, they go through the motion of, of very different um, learning activities from ca uh, CAD design, electronics, fabrication, microbiology, real-time object tracking, and, and so forth. And we actually published uh, kind of this coursework. So if you want to uh, do a course like this, um, uh, we have all the instructions there. So to summarize this part, um, the idea here is um, that we have a, a setup uh, that, you, that is educational in kind of three different ways. Uh, you can build it yourself, you can play with it, and you also can do real scientific uh, uh, inquiry. Right? OK. So Another way of bringing things uh, to people rather than letting them build yourself is you put it on the web and let uh, uh, students or children access it uh, uh, through a website, right? And so we built uh, essentially the same system that you just saw, um, but put it on a website where this is uh, the site. You have a microscope view into the uh, microscope and another external view, and you have a joystick here, which is in this case now a virtual joystick. And depending on which direction you, you, you pull the joystick, LEDs come on and uh, move the cells around. So we haven't implemented any games on that, but uh, it kind of emphasizes that you can go online and do interactive experiments, right? Um, so we ran a number of studies. So this is uh, a collaborator of mine in the Stanford School of Education, Paolo Blickstein, and the students of his, where we uh, went to a San Francisco school where the students then logged on to our system and ran experiments and also data analysis. Um, so here's uh, how a typical study design, but also the, the lecture itself uh, would look like. Lecture goes for about an hour, so there's some pre and post test, and then a student would first do some experiment, some data analysis, and, and then some uh, modeling. So you have an impression of the um, student activity, other students did the experiments their own, or kind of they all did it in front of the class. Uh, interesting fact, due to firewall considerations, other things, and bandwidth limitation, it's often easier in schools to kind of just do it um, kind of front of a class. Also leads to better, uh, better discussions among, uh, among students. So they do an experiment, or a couple of those, then they get their data, um, then they can afterwards look at the movies they have generated, and for example, can count how many cells have responded to light, how noisy is it, how fast do they respond, uh, things like that. And then as a third component, uh, we built uh, a modeling interface 
where you see in the background actually the real cells and there's one cell traced out. And then we emulate uh, one cell with 3D physics uh, realistically. And the students can uh, basically tune three parameters that affect the cell's motion or the motion of this, this model. One is the forward speed. One is how fast it actually rolls around its own axis. And the third one is how strongly this uh, light uh, is actually coupled uh, to the uh, change in motion, so how light sensitive the organism is. And uh, what, what you basically find out if you play with this for a while is that you really need to roll around your own axis to really track, uh, uh, track the light in, in, in 3D, and then you can really follow this uh, prescribed uh, motion or the, the cell uh, follows it. And so students basically dabble around this for, for like 10 minutes until they kind of have uh, found a solution um, that kind of uh, fits the data and thereby really uh, understood something about the inner working of, of um, uh, Euglena. And so based on the post-test, I mean, we found that the students uh, learned the content about Euglena and, and, and phototaxis. And another um, important feature is also that uh, the children felt agency, that they uh, felt they could be successful in, in what they are doing. And also when asking the teachers, they say it's actually an interesting way um, of bringing things to a classroom where it's much lower in terms of logistics, so they don't have to bring out a microscope and, and these things. They can do much more uh, within the class time. And of course, I'm not suggesting that we should substitute all hands-on um, uh, activities with everything online, but it's certainly um, something that can complement uh, the, the regular uh, biology um, curriculum that's uh, going on with the, with the normal microscope. And um, I also taught a, a class with my students uh, at Stanford where um, this was a little bit more advanced, where the students after the experiment basically uh, get their data, they can, can offload, they get a movie like this and where all the, the cells are automatically traced and then they can, can analyze these movies and for example test hypotheses of whether these cells uh, change their velocity when um, uh, light is on versus off. And, and surprisingly actually when you turn on the light, the cells on average uh, seem to swim uh, a little bit slower. Um, so in, in this case, again, it enabled the students uh, a number of things which I've not shown here also to model how, how, these, how these cells work. And this was a pure theory-based class, but at the same time, the students could go home and, and do experiments over the web. Um, right? um, so a little bit more uh, how this works. Uh, this is a setup, um, maybe hard to see, but essentially it's, it's a microscope. Importantly, we have now a reservoir here with these uh, cells, which uh, automatically uh, can be flushed into, into this microfidic device. It's all controlled by, by Raspberry Pi. And since these cells, these Euglena cells are so sturdy, so they can live in here for a couple of, of days to weeks, um, we can actually have this thing run uh, semi-automatically uh, uh, for weeks without much uh, intervention. Um, uh, this is actually shown here. Again, the setup, and if you, so this is day, so for example, tracking uh, over 10 days, the, the concentration and the number of cells in, uh, and then how well they respond to light in, in the chamber, you see that in this particular case it was very constant. In other cases, sometimes the number of cells increases or decreases or the responses uh, uh, deteriorates, which we then can automatically um, uh, put fresh organisms in, which also the system uh, monitors uh, itself. And uh, here you actually see the whole system, uh, kind of this uh, cluster of, of, of setups where we have six of those. And again, the system automatically monitors which of them is good and bad, and so students can be routed to one that is good, uh, which is kind of uh, depicted here. Now, interestingly, if you now kind of think of the numbers, like how much uh, could you supply uh, in, in terms of cost? Um, a setup like this costs about $250. Maintenance costs maybe also on a similar scale like this for a year because you may want to change uh, everything, uh, the organisms, uh, every, every month within a, in a setup. And an experiment takes about a minute, um, which uh, by numbers comes down to about half a million experiment you could do on a single uh, machine like this, uh, which costs far less than a, uh, than a cent. And if you compare this, for example, to the number of students in the US alone, uh, to take biology classes, which is maybe half a million, you can see that you kind of really, with a single system, you kind of get in, into uh, uh, relevant numbers. And so kind of building something like this out, you could really make a, make a cost-effective difference to education, not only in the US, but basically worldwide, right? Okay. So kind of to summarize this part, um, so we can do biology experimentation in, in the cloud, certainly at cost at scale. We can think about putting other experiments on there. Um, 
I showed you in, uh, initially in the slide, um, at the beginning of the talk, there are many other microfluidic devices um, that, that could be uh, put on here. And uh, in terms of application, there is, of course, the whole question about uh, online education, uh, which I just talked about. We can think about um, letting scientists actually run experiments on there um, that usually don't have access to, to equipment. Um, we can also think about better utilization of equipment in general, and you may also have heard of uh, citizen science uh, projects where we could even uh, hope to let the public uh, do experiments on, on these kind of systems and hopefully discover uh, something new. Okay. Um. Now I want to talk about a project um, where we uh, were interested to bring uh, these kind of interactive experience into science museums and really have this much more touch-like uh, interactivity that I showed you uh, earlier. So this is again uh, the, uh, uh, from the very first slide, I think, the mo um, where um, you basically can draw on a touch screen, project onto these cells, these again, these Euglena cells, and have a real-time interactive experience. Here uh, is the depiction or the, the schema of, of the setup, the touch screen. You have a regular projector. It's actually a Pico projector with a slightly different optics. You project it in a small scale. Then you have a microscope, microscope camera, and you have a closed loop feedback. Um, you can also actually look through the eyepiece of the microscope and even see inside, and not only see the cells, but actually also see what you're drawing. And then also schematicized, you have this automatic culturing, which makes it for a rather stable uh, system. So the system in particular we used in the museum is shown here. So it's a different magnification that you just saw before. So rather than interacting with a swarm of cells, you interact with, uh, with a single one. So the user has basically drawn uh, a circle of light, and this in the individual cell is then kind of captured uh, inside, right? Or whenever it's just kind of hitting the, the light, uh, it, it turns around. So just showing this again, so watch this cell swimming here, and then you see the light, and as soon as it hits the light, it, it kind of turns. Right? Here you see this setup in real. Um, here are the cells. Uh, that's where the uh, microfluidic chamber actually is. You see the projector. And importantly, if you look through this eyepiece, as I said before, you see the cells, but you also see the light that is projected. Um, and now you can do different things. Uh, you can, for example, do simple color experiments. Um, for example, which color does the cell really respond to? If you draw with red light, you start realizing that the cells just swim through. The same thing with uh, green light. So they're not, not very sensitive to that. But as soon as you use blue light as before, then the cells um, uh, start turning around. And you can actually try um, even to draw to the over the front and the back of the cell and see where the eye spot is. And it's actually a little bit uh, a harder experiment to do due to uh, lag of the projector and other things. But we really enable something, or we're close to enabling something where you can do subcellular experiments uh, in some sort of museum uh, setting. Right? You can also uh, try to make games on, on that platform. So again, we have a virtual object, which is overlaid. And here, the kind of the interaction is more indirect, right? where you can draw a certain barriers and then hope that the cell somehow bounces off the barrier and uh, uh, captures uh, those objects. Right? And so lots of interesting questions now. I mean, how do you effectively uh, design games on, on, on a platform uh, like this? What kind of uh, game mechanisms lend themselves well? Here's another game. Uh, where you get points by getting the most cells into the box. Uh, and uh, if you just draw a circle, that's maybe not very effective. If you draw a bigger circle and make the circle smaller and smaller over time, you, you can uh, corral them. Right? And these are kind of very simple games, a kind of more demonstration type, but it's also the kind of thing that works well in, in a museum setting. And uh, so we did a number of user studies in the uh, tech museum um, in San Jose. The way it was set up is we have the big screen. Uh, we have the setup here encased, but here's the eyepiece. You can see uh, into the microscope. You can also see, actually, if you look, look inside, you can actually see the whole, whole setup. And then just having uh, two main signs, like look uh, and doodle. And then what happens is that uh, usually uh, people come along, uh, play on the screen, but then also look through the eyepiece and even start uh, interacting with each other. So what you see here is a number of kids, and then this is one of us just taking notes uh, for the user studies. 
Importantly, um, what we find is that people spend on average two to three minutes on, on the setup, and uh, which is important because this kind of is really the kind of prolonged engagement that you want to have in a museum setting. And if you have been to science museums, you will find in the physics exhibits, for example, you have pendulums and sand and electronics and all these kind of things which people are very engaged with and spend lots of time. If you go to the life science sections, maybe you have some petting zoo. Um, maybe you can control a microscope, but these setups are usually not as interactive and not as engaging. So I think with these kind of setups, we can really um, uh, make a difference uh, here. Um, so here's some examples of what people usually do. They come to the touch screen, draw all sorts of things, and over uh, some time they realize there's other things moving in the background that's actually responding uh, to what they uh, are drawing. Um, here's an example of, of one person. Um, who drew, uh, initially kind of captured the cell and then made a little maze and then kind of saw how the cell is actually going outside of the maze. And this whole activity for this person uh, took uh, uh, less than, uh, took about two minutes. And so we kind of argued that we allowed someone who's never done any microfidics before to make a microfidic maze uh, in, inside of the museum, right? Um, also importantly, what I mentioned before, if you look through the microscope, you see actually the things uh, that you draw on the screen, which can also lead to user interaction where one person is looking through the, through the microscope, the other person um, is drawing something on the, on the screen, and they kind of make guessing games like, you need to guess what I draw, and uh, things like those. Which is also important, right, because you want to have people getting engaged, uh, becoming engaged with, the other, with each other and, and discuss what they're doing. And finally, this is kind of a prototyping stage, uh, which we started with the Exploratorium. Rather than drawing on a screen, using a Kinect uh, to project your body shape onto these cells, right, and then projecting everything uh, large on the screen. And then you can see how basically this human interacts with these cells, kind of with the whole uh, body shape. And so it's interesting because it really brings, in that case, cells at kind of the level, at the scale of humans. But if you then look through the microscope, you actually see a little person dancing in there. And so kind of you bring yourself also, you shrink yourself down to the level of, of these microscopes, and you can, can interact with them. Okay. So just to summarize that, um, we're basically uh, done a number of these, these tests now in, in museum settings uh, where uh, users can interact with these, with these cells. We also did some tests where we kind of hit the box and just had a screen, which works much less. Many people don't recognize it's, it's real. And so I think this is a very promising uh, way forward to enable people not only to learn about the biology, but also learn about the biotechnology that allows um, uh, these kind of uh, setups. Now I want to uh, come to the question of ethics. So when we have this in public spaces, there always maybe 10% of people, of adults, ask, like, is it even ethical? Should you play with living organisms? Right? Is this okay of doing it? And so I actually wrote an ethics piece with a um, bioethicist on it. And there's a number of, um, of um, objections you could potentially have of why you should not play uh, with life. Um, a big one is the animal welfare, right? I mean, do you cause any pain? But a question like respect for life, are you playing God? Uh, the yuck factor, some people may not just have some uh, negative visceral response. There's the slippery slope argument, like now you do it with single cells, but are you doing it with monkeys uh, soon? Trivial pursuit, right? This is a waste of taxpayers' money, for example. Is it publicly safe, right? Like uh, maybe we create a super virus by playing with it and it escapes in the wild. There was a question about game ethics, right? Like, I mean, are the games meaningful? We can ask about things like if someone makes a discovery, he owns it, and things like those. So in this paper, we basically detailed uh, these kind of objections that uh, could come about. For the types of things that I showed you, we can actually say for all of them, they are within bounds, so there is nothing really uh, bad about it. But we also put forward some general uh, recommendations uh, to follow. Um, one thing is you certainly don't want to cause any pain or harm, right? Uh, certainly these are single-celled organisms. Um, if you bake your pizza, for example, and put your dough in the oven, you kill, kill them by the millions, uh, organisms of similar uh, complexity. Um, we should engage with the public, and I mean, that's really our um, intention here that we uh, want to teach people um, about modern biotechnology uh, and uh, about the life science and give them a way of, of understanding uh, what's going on in the field as such. There's a question about respect for life, right? Like, I mean, what is a game that really has a um, way to respect a single-celled organism? And of course, you could 
could make some parallels, like if you play with your dog and you throw, throw a, a bone and, uh, or a ball and kind of the dog comes back and forth and you have this interactivity with your dog, right, versus dog fighting, right? So you can have some positive uh, experience uh, with that. Um, I certainly think we should kind of view these things as interacting with single-celled organisms and maybe not manipulating, but those are interesting uh, uh, reflective questions. And then also you should, of course, have respect for the player. Like if you make something like this, you want to have the people have a positive outcome, for example, uh, learn something uh, interesting. Um, now, um, while we made these uh, types of systems, um, we get increasingly better of how long it takes us to actually create something new, but still there's a quite, a, quite a combination of like how much hardware do we need to develop and how easy is, is it uh, to, to eventually program or, or develop a, a game. And so I'm kind of, um, and I'm also kind of interested, could we create something which is eventually like kind of the microcomputer that uh, came uh, big in the late 70s and, and 80s, where you could basically play games on, on, a, on a physical setup, but then also program them much easier by saying, like, if you have a number of cells that you want to execute some tasks, right? For example, come together, move in a certain direction, then move up. Could even write a scripting language that does these things for you, and if you can, does it make, for example, um, game design much, much easier. And so the setup um, uh, that we use for that is, is basically now combining the two that you saw before uh, with a projector from below, but then also uh, LEDs from the side, which gives you um, both spatial and uh, global um, um, uh, control of the cells. And so this is shown here. Uh, where with the projector you create a, a barrier and then with light from this side you actually drive the cells in, into a certain position and then later you close this, um, uh, this box off. You can, for example, have a command which says like concentrate cells at a particular position which does nothing more, creating this light barrier, driving the cells in, and then you have cells at a, at a high concentration, right? Another command you can come up with is clear screen where you kind of define a region have light from this side and over time basically clear off uh, the whole area. Right? And so you can see how you can develop a programming language around that, uh, executing these, these various commands, maybe even combined with uh, uh, object uh, recognition. And here's some example of uh, what a game then uh, could look like here. This is kind of the in initialization of the game where we try to clear off this area, but at the same time concentrate cells here. And then the game uh, works as follows. There's light coming on here, cells go in this direction, and you should somehow should get the cells into this box. And as you see, it's not happening because they're all kind of stuck at this line. So in this particular case, you lose the game. But if you kind of play it well, um, which is shown as a replay, what you have to do is basically erase this barrier, and then the cells move in. Right? So, um, and then you can, with the same mechanism, actually can create multiple levels. Now, um, another level is you should not let the cells go in here, so you have to draw a barrier. And uh, in the third case, you will see that uh, there's one region where the cells should go in, another ones where they should not go in, and the cells are again kind of driven by these LEDs that are on for a while in this direction, and then in another direction. And you as a player basically have to, have to kind of draw barriers uh, on the screen. Um, so in case this was a little bit uh, hard to understand, so kind of summarizing this here, right, like in this first level, uh, you need to get the cells in here. The way you do it is by raising this boundary and then eventually the cells move in there. In the second level, um, the cells should not go into this region, so you kind of draw the barrier and they kind of get stuck all on the outside. And then the third one is a little bit more complicated where you um, uh, should get them, have them in here, but not in here. And so you kind of need to draw and, and, and erase certain things. And what kind of this is supposed to demonstrate is really that you can create um, kind of more complex uh, interactivities can create levels and, and program these uh, uh, things. So this is kind of summarized here. So we call this uh, SCUP, like a script creation utility for biobot swarms, where you can basically write a number of commands and make cells uh, do something for you. And for those of you who either uh, know a little bit about retro games or a little bit older and know these games still, so this is SCUM, uh, kind of a script uh, um, creation utility for Maniac Mansion, which was kind of very influential games, uh, a game in the 80s, where um, basically writing adventure games 
which in a similar way you could animate characters in, in a very uh, uh, simple, simple way. And um, b beyond games, right, we can again also think a little bit further in saying like these are also general uh, ways uh, if you want to control micro robotic swarms for maybe other purposes, right, like how could you make cells do certain tasks at a microscopic scale that you may uh, want to do, okay? So I also want to say a little bit about some other organisms that we tried. Just to give you some, some sense that not everything needs to be done just with Euglena at the, at the single cell uh, scale. So first of all, here you see, it's actually again Euglena, but this is about a million Euglena which are in a chamber like that. And uh, it's a flat chamber. And if you project light onto them, um, then you can actually generate something like a photographic response, which then later kind of uh, diverges into more bioconvection pattern. So the way it works is you have, you have this uh, dish with the cells you project the pattern on, namely this one. You see how all the cells basically to the photophobic uh, response first go into these dark regions. But there's an, another phenomenon that sets in because all the cells swim to the top and they, uh, the fluid becomes top heavy. Actually, the top heavy fluid fluid sinks down with all the cells and then the cells start swimming up again and you get much more uh, complex uh, interactions. And so actually we made also some, some games on, on, on these types of behaviors where you don't really see the individual cells but still you're interacting with the cells at a more microscopic uh, scale. Here's a, a, another cell which is called, uh, it's actually not a cell, it's a multicellular organism, Volvox. These little cells here are again euglena, but this is uh, a Volvox, and as you can see, if light is coming from this side, euglena cells swim in this direction, Volvox swim in that direction. Um, and so it is another uh, kind of demonstration how you can interact with, with organisms uh, at, at these kind of scales. Also want to mention basically all the organisms that we show here can, uh, are commonly used in, in schools, right? They are safe to use. And uh, this is also interesting. Um, in, in respect, like what happens if you have multiple organisms inside your interactivity, which we have not been able to pursue um, uh, that far. You can also do things on a, on a totally different uh, time scale and also length scale. So this is a Petri dish, it's actually more macroscopic. And what you see in yellow is a, a slime mold, it's called Fusarum. And in red, you see where a robot actually uh, places a food solution. And you can see initially this organism forages for food, finds it, and then always is kind of tracking uh, this uh, food trail that is laid out. And uh, here, actually, this whole experiment that you see, it takes about a day uh, to run. And uh, it takes an image of, of about every 10 minutes. We also built a, a cloud lab for that so that students could online and do these types of experiments. And actually, it was a Lego robot that, that executes these, these things. So it's kind of schematized here, where you have a number of Petri dishes sitting on a flatbed scanner. And then a robot is just kind of placing this food. And uh, this is also interesting, again, kind of showing how you can do things on a very different time and length scale. But since it takes about a day, the interactivity is, of course, uh, uh, totally different. And the throughput is much slower. Also, the logistics of running something like this, like making Petri dishes, putting them in there, um, is, is, is much, uh, much higher. But so I ran this uh, over 10 weeks course um, that I uh, taught for biophysics uh, and bioengineering students. But I kind of did these types of experiments and then also made models and, and analyzed uh, uh, their data. Just also to note, like uh, with these, uh, uh, Lego robots that we built, you can then also do all sorts of other fun things, for example, um, pipetting uh, uh, food colors in, in uh, this standing plastic ware, like this 46, uh, 24 well plates here, for example, right, like making concentration series. Also more complicated experiments like um, doing gene uh, in induction. And uh, here's another um, um, uh, form factor, another robot that we've built. It's actually a one-dimensional robot which only uh, moves uh, along one, one dimension. The whole uh, pipetting is done with a very simple uh, syringe, right, which is kind of uh, actuated here uh, uh, with, with a single motor. Here's the one child um, kind of pipetting just with the motor itself, or you place the whole thing on a robot. You can then do, for example, um, uh, uh, dilution series experiments, right? Or you can do uh, salt layering experiments where these different colors have different concentration of salt and you can then kind of nicely uh, stack them on top of each other. Also, this particular robot um, is built solely from the pieces in, a, uh, in the educational LEGO Mindstorm set, the new EV3 set. So if you want to build this, I mean, just having the set, which many schools uh, have, you can actually build this and do experiments along those lines. 
Um, we have tried a few things also with more biological uh, um, critters, like for example putting yeast in and feeding different uh, sugar solutions. Um, right now with these colors that, that seems to work uh, uh, much better and, and more easy. But we kind of advanced this forward. And here the idea is also, again, this whole uh, mechatronics field, right, like these Lego robotics competition things that are primarily about, uh, about robots that can maybe move around, the kind of shoot balls, how can we integrate those into more uh, life science? How can we bring these fields together? Also the question of whether this would be more attractive actually to, to um, girls and female engineers um, who are maybe more interested in artistic uh, aspects and maybe biology and thereby bringing these, these, these fields together. So let me uh, come to, um, towards the conclusion, kind of reflecting a little bit more. If we want to make these kind of interactivities work, uh, what we certainly need is, is biology, and we need the devices that have an actuator and a sensor, right? may sound obvious, but if you go in the conventional uh, biology lab, you usually have things that you can either manipulate biology or you can measure something, but often uh, not both. And so we call these uh, things in general biotic processing uh, unit or, or BPU. And uh, for, in order to make them really convenient to use, it's actually uh, beneficial if they have a digital input and digital output layer that are kind of well-defined, which is the case, for example, if you have a standard webcam and a projector, right? They directly f interface with your computer. Um, if you go, for example, to this very first Paramecia game that I showed you, um, where we really had everything soldered um, uh, ourselves, you kind of lose this kind of uh, ease of, of uh, programmability and, and, and interaction. And uh, if you look at all sorts of other um, um, chips that you have, uh, like CPUs, GPUs, right? It's kind of the similar idea, and that's why we call this BPU, where you have digital input and output, and uh, there's something in between, which in this case now is not only digital, but there's some biology that, of course, has some more or less uh, noisy response, but hopefully uh, still defined in, in, in certain boundaries. And uh, you can now ask what's the performance uh, metrics of, of such a, a system, right? What's the clock speed, uh, things like those. Um, uh, one way, presumably the most meaningful way of, of measuring the performance is the mutual information that you have. Basically, if, if you would apply stimulus and nothing would respond, then it would not be meaningful for any sort of interaction. So you can ask, like, how much, if, if you put a stimulus in, how much response do you get out of it? And to make this a little bit more, more illustrative, if you have these, these euglena that maybe respond on a time scale of about 10 seconds, if you just have two LEDs and they respond to, to your input, then you can say maybe you have one bit per 10 seconds. If you have two LEDs, you have a mutual information of above two bit uh, for 10 seconds. If we have, like, um, this projector-based system, and you can even subdivide it into many areas where different people, for example, work on different areas and different colors. You can increase that. And uh, just a very contrasting case with this fusarum that I showed you earlier, with this chemical stimulus where an experiment runs about uh, a day and where it takes uh, the organism uh, about 20 minutes to kind of react to one drop, you get a drastically lower um, uh, uh, mutual information out of the system, right? So the throughput is much lower. And these kind of things are important if you're saying like you want to, for example, make a cloud lab where you want to teach a million kids or allow a million kids to do something, you can put these kind of metrics and saying like how powerful is this uh, or not. So um, conceptualizing uh, on the left half, you see all kind of the digital things um, that uh, we are so familiar with, right? And uh, as I said, what we need is always stimulus, stimuli and, and some sort of a sensors with the biology in the middle to kind of uh, drive these things. But then mostly what, we've, what I've shown you, right, is working with light stimuli and then kind of camera sensors, which are very, very convenient uh, to handle. What we'd love to do more in the future is, of course, having uh, much more biological stimuli, for example, what, what happens if you apply chemicals, and also more um, biological uh, sensors. Can the cell, for example, change its, its uh, color and other things? And there's lots of enabling uh, technology that's getting increasingly better, as I mentioned before. We have all these microfluidics that get increasingly more complex, but you can also think about uh, genetic engineering where um, you can basically create um, or manipulate uh, certain um, uh, cells, for example, to be more responsive to light or other stimuli. And all these kind of things will enable us to create uh, these kind of interactivities um, uh, better and better in, in the future. 
Um, and also, uh, kind of, uh, if we compare uh, the uh, computer science and computer technology to the biotechnology, you can actually argue, depending on which kind of standpoint we come from, you can argue there's maybe a 50 year lag, which kind of is a good thing to extrapolate in the future. For example, there has been the foundations of, of quantum mechanics, right? And in the life science, we have like the, the structure of DNA. There were kind of the, the golden years where most of the discoveries uh, were made, and then in the uh, late 40s, right, the um, transistor and the integrated circuits came around and then over the uh, past decades since then we had all these uh, increasing advancements um, in consumer technology and so forth. And similarly, kind of these um, uh, equivalencies to, to transistor and integrated circuits now exist in, 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 in biotechnology. And we can ask when were the first games made in, in the life, uh, in, in electronics, right? This happened soon after the first, uh, these, these things came about. And so it's pretty fitting that we now make games on, on these types of platforms. And we can also ask, like, when will you do this at home? When will you have things that, that uh, like a home computer? And so a prediction would be maybe five to 10 years, you should have something similar like that. And I hope kind of what I showed you, the technology is kind of ripe, certainly for hacker type uh, uh, activities and all school activities, but I'm sure pretty soon we will have something more uh, consumer type. So to summarize, uh, what we're interested in is really how can we interact uh, with cells uh, on a microscopic scale? These are the people over the years kind of worked with me in my lab on, on these types of projects. So the general, um, as I said before, I started with like, let's play games, but I think now much more general, how can we interact uh, with biotechnology and these, these processes at these small scales? I showed you a number of platforms, which is kind of key that we now reach this level where things are long-term robust and become uh, uh, freely programmable. I um, showed you different, different things, uh, phone system, kind of these museum type systems, and also these cloud experimentation systems, which are, you know, really allow us to do things at cost at scale. Uh, a key feature is really thinking about kind of a core unit that you can interact with, so these biotic processing units. We have biology in there, but which essentially has like digital input output, so you can uh, interact uh, with it or interface it with your, with your digital uh, world that, that, that we are so used to now. And there's a number of, of uh, applications. Certainly education is, is right now, and formal and informal education, the most promising uh, one. But in the longer term, I think we will use this for research uh, micro robotics and, and, and other things. So, and uh, looking forward, what else will come out of it? And uh, so contact me if you're interested in kind of working with, with us, collaborate, and also if you want to uh, have more information on the papers um, that we've published. So thank you very much and have some time for questions. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you, Ingmar. I'm gonna bring you to the middle so we can get some, some Q&A going. Uh, so we're going to open the floor for questions. We've got time for a few, and the catch box is ready for you. You can join me over on sure. this side. Any takers? Oh, and I also want right. to emphasize this is workshop in the afternoon, right? Like, so come to that. Yes. It's at 4, right? At 4, four. o'clock, okay. right in the science workshop space over there, the biohacking games. And it's student-led? Yeah, it's student-led. Um, thanks for the organizers who put all of this up here who are in the audience. And uh, yeah, so you can try some of these things yourself. That's the idea. Awesome, fantastic. So I do have a question for you. This was really exciting, especially to see how much middle school students pick up the experiments. Um, what are you most excited about next? And how does it look like getting other teachers to take on these things within their classrooms? So certainly I would be excited if it gets out more and used more, right, by other schools, by hacker spaces and, and so forth. So that's one thing. And the other is I would be excited if, if um, a school supply company would kind of, for example, sell a kit that uh, would easily be to be purchased and uh, schools could, for example, uh, build something like that. Similarly, I would look forward to be able to buy a computer equivalent, like the equivalent to a home computer. That would be cool. Um, yeah. Right. Any questions from our audience? Awesome. Passing this over to you. Okay. Yep. Speak right into the top. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> I have a question. It's uh, clunk of computation. So, clunk of computation, experimentation. What's the limitation to bring it to a research lab? I'm a researcher, so that's my major interest so far. So, what do we have to do in order to have it in my lab and work with it? Okay. okay, so question about using these things for, for research. There's certainly the question, 
do you want to do all sorts of experiments you dream of? And then you come in this limitation that right now you saw like it's about euglena, it's about light stimulus, which kind of sounds rather limited. But if you go to a normal bio lab, right, like you want to work with different organisms, all sorts of stimuli. And so there are some commercial cloud lab companies now out there that pursue that kind of uh, things where you hit a totally different price point, like it's much more expensive and it's much more, um, the throughput is much lower. And so I think it's really, really the question, do you want to do this for education or do you want to do it for research? You would kind of design these things differently. I still would think if you want to do something like have theoreticians that are interested in microswimmers um, work with this, they should be able to work on our platform. Or if you want to do citizen science, where you say, like, one have 10,000 people all do very similar experiments that are simple, you could also do that. But real research, you may have to go um, to much more advanced um, uh, pipeline of, of experiments that you can deliver. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hold on to it. We've got room for one more question. Anyone interested? And you get to toss that green box around, if so. All right, you can pass it back to me instead. <laughs> Thanks. That was way better than the toss I gave you. Thank you. Uh, one more round of applause, please, for Professor Ingmar Riedel-Kruzer. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah.